Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. I've been playing around with some hard drives recently, creating some backup drives and portable retro gaming systems, but I kept coming up against a range of drive options that I didn't really know what they meant. So in this video I'm going to show you what I've learnt about BIOS and UEFI motherboards and how that then relates into MBR and GPT drive setups. So to start with, um, let's find out in general terms what all this is about. So today's computers ha have gotten very complex with endless options and specifications for almost every aspect and every component inside your machine. But fundamentally they are still the same as our home computers of the 1980s. So you have a microprocessor which uses memory in the form of RAM and ROM to store data and code. Now, now I do know there are a whole raft of memory technologies but let's just keep it simple for the moment. So the microprocessor is also then connected to some peripheral input output devices to control things like the display, the keyboard, the mouse and so on. And it's also connected to some sort of storage media to save and load data to and from for more permanent storage. So when you first turn the computer on, the microprocessor springs into action, but it needs some sort of code to tell it what to do. And this code is usually stored on a memory chip on the motherboard. So this firmware code then has enough information to connect the processor to the main peripherals such as the hard drive, keyboard and screen so that it can then start to load other code to complete this boot sequence and then load your operating system. So how is this startup process organised and where are the options that we're discussing come into play? So, Right back in the first days of the IBM PC, a basic input output system software or, or, or BIOS was used to start the computer and, and this was usually stored on a reprogrammable ROM chip on the motherboard so that the manufacturer could update the code from time to time through BIOS updates. So the BIOS had very limited capabilities and actually ran in a special 16-bit mode on the processor which only allowed it to run text-based screen output and connect then to some of the major inputs and outputs. So if you, you, it was able to connect to the keyboard, so if you pressed a special key when you first powered on the computer, the BIOS would stop the boot sequence and drop you into a special user interface where you could test and set up various parts of the system. You could also turn on or off various devices, specify which drives to boot from, etc. and, and, and so on. So if, if you were to let then the BIOS continue with the boot sequence, it would initialise any hard drives attached to the PC and then start scanning them in order. And what it was doing here, it would be looking for bootloader code that it could load to give it more information on how to start the computer. So, so this bootloader code needed to be stored in the very first sector on a hard disk and this was called the master boot record or MBR. So, so to make a disk readable in a BIOS based system it had to be formatted to include this master boot record and that gave us our MBR disks. So th this BIOS then, it, it was king up until about the mid-1990s and at that time processor manufacturers were, were basically Intel. They felt that the old BIOS setup was too limiting for the increasingly more powerful PCs and especially for their servers. So they, so they developed something called the Extensible Firmware Interface or EFI which was going to replace BIOS with a more modern alternative. Now this was developed by Intel over the next few years until they joined up with other manufacturers to create the open source unified EFI project and that was so that they could standardise on how this whole system would work. And of course that gave us then UEFI and that came in at around about 2006. So, so UEFI, it does exactly the same job as BIOS but it does it in a different way that allows it to run in a more powerful environment. So it still uses a very basic firmware startup code and, and I guess you could even call this a, a sort of a BIOS and that gives it access to the hard disks. So it then looks on these disks for a special .efi file and that is stored on a special disk partition called the EFI system partition or, or ESP. So this ESP then contains the actual code to run the UEFI 
UEFI boot sequence, but as it's now being loaded from the hard drive with the processor running in either 32 or 64 bit mode, it can be a much more complex piece of software with full access to USB devices, graphics, the mouse, and so on. So it also allowed the hardware manufacturers to build in firmware based security, such as Secure Boot. And you'll have come across this if you've ever tried to install Windows 11. So this uses security keys to authorize boot software to run on your machine. And as the system boots, any code that is not officially signed and authorized can't run. So, so things like rootkits and other malware, they, they use this technique to hack into your computer, but then the secure boot sequence then prevents them from gaining access. So as with BIOS, UEFI requires your hard drive to be set up in a specific way to give the firmware access to the files it needs. So to use all the features of modern UEFI systems, you need to create a GPT, or, or, and that stands for GUID Partition Table Drive. So, so the GUID part, that stands for Globally Unique ID. Um, and, and that then um, is an assigned number to every partition or section of your hard drive. So this ID number is, is actually so random that it's actually regarded as unique then for every hard drive partition on the planet, which of course is that globally unique bit. So, so GPT drives also have a range of other benefits. So on an MBR drive, the boot sector can become corrupted. And if this happens, you actually then have to go and rebuild the drive. It, it tends to lose track of what's going on. But on a GPT drive, it actually stores multiple copies of the boot information so that if one part gets corrupted, it can then recover itself. So, so GPT drives also then remove any of the limitations of MBR. So master boot record then was, was created when something like a one gigabyte hard drive was deemed to be massive. So comparing our MBR and GPT, so each disk is divided up into blocks. So our MBR drive uses a 32-bit address for the blocks, whereas GPT uses 64 bits. So this gives us 2 to the power of 32 blocks on MBR and 2 to the power of 64 on GPT. Now each block in an MBR disk can store 512 bytes, whereas we can get up to 4096 bytes per block on GPT. Now if we multiply that out, that then gives us a maximum MBR disk size of 2.2 terabytes, whereas our GPT then um, comes in with a whopping 75.6 times 10 to the 9 terabytes, which um, is actually called a zettabyte. So we have 75.6 zettabytes, which um, is, is a lot of storage really. And if you've ever looked at the sort of console modding and so on like that, you'll come across the maximum 2.2 terabytes of the hard disk size you can put inside something like a PS3 or an Xbox 360. And this is where it comes from. OK, so those systems, of course, are using MBR. So with this and other enhancements, the UEFI and GPT setup it is definitely the way forward. And indeed, pretty much every computer being made at the moment either enforces or has UEFI as an option. But what about then compatibility issues? So if, if you need your hard drive to work and boot on any device, then actually MBR is still the best route to go. UEFI machines are generally backwards compatible with MBR drives, but not all BIOS machines can use the new GPT format, especially some of the older things such as consoles, such as the PS3 and Xbox or Xbox 360. Now, if, if your hard drive is larger than two terabytes, then your hands are tied and you'll have to use GPT. So, so do take this into consideration as well. So, so what you're going to be using your hard drive for when you purchase any hard hardware then for your project. So going for a massive hard drive um, then could just simply mean that it doesn't work on the device that you want it to. So hopefully then that's given you some insight into the various firmware and hardware um, drive setups that you'll need to choose from when you're playing around with your projects. 
Now, as I mentioned at the start, I've been looking into this so that I can reuse some of my old hard drives for backup storage and for retro gaming setups. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, then please do subscribe to the channel so you don't miss my new videos as I release them. So I hope you found this video useful and that you'll come back soon for more gaming, modding, electronics and techie stuff. So have fun and bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.